Hi, thank you for watching Digging to China. I'm Dong Xiong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. There is no doubt that the Xi Jinping expected to celebrate the new year by touting the superiority of his authoritarian economic and governance model. Instead, he is trying to manage a healthcare crisis, a weakening economy, and political protests. These vulnerabilities have debunked the narrative that China's rise to global dominance is inevitable. Xi's zero-COVID U-turn, the spread of the virus, has exposed the weakness of Chinese Communist Party. The demonstration in November are signs of social discontent. Xi simply cannot expect to maintain political control if he continues to impose such authoritarian restrictions. The end of zero COVID was in large part an admission of Beijing's unsustainable financial situation. In early December, Beijing said local governments would be responsible for the cost of daily COVID testing. These local governments were put in charge of the healthcare emergency in addition to their responsibilities for education, unemployment insurance, and retirement. They are also still expected to stimulate economic growth through building infrastructure and subsidizing local industries. It is no doubt that cash-strapped local governments either balked at zero COVID policy or enforced the policy half-heartedly. With hindsight, it is clear that rather than save its people from the worst of the pandemic, the Communist Party merely delayed their agony, leaving residents questioning whether their sacrifices over the past three years were worth anything. Far from highlighting the effectiveness of the CCP, the COVID-19 fiasco serves as the latest reminder of how ineffective and irresponsible the regime is. The most telling aspect of the CCP's about face is how little is known about how the decision was made. There was no public debate about its merits and drawbacks or any official ac acknowledgement that it was being considered. Many outside observers assume it was a last-minute decision spurred by the protest that broke out across China in late November. However, as a matter of fact, Beijing had lost control of the outbreak well before the protest started and had solicited advice on easing restrictions from Hong Kong experts earlier that month. It is possible that infections were already spreading so fast that continued adherence to the policy would have exposed it as a failure. Whatever the reason, Beijing scrapped its pandemic control before China was prepared to cope with the consequences. While no accurate data are available and most people are no longer being tested, Estimates leaked by Chinese health officials indicate that around 250 million were infected in the first 20 days of December alone. Throughout the country, cold medicine and other essentials are completely sold out. In many locations, hospitals are overfilled and though the official death toll remains low, reports indicate that the crematoriums can't keep up with demand. In retrospect, it was naive to expect China's reopening to be anything but chaotic. At its core, zero COVID was a CCP political campaign, and as is common with such campaigns, there was so much at stake politically that it couldn't be walked back in an orderly fashion. As the Omicron variant spread last year, the government started to recognize zero COVID was unsustainable. But the CCP had tied its legitimacy to its ability to keep the virus tightly controlled, and it couldn't find a viable off-ramp. It tried to relax some restrictions in mid-November, likely as the first step of a gradual reopening. But these adjustments resulted in even more disruption as the virus spread to a growing number of locations where officials remained under pressure to keep outbreaks tightly controlled. 
The political nature of zero COVID also prevented officials from preparing for what would follow the campaign. Between mid-2020 and early 2022, China had the coronavirus largely under control within its borders. As the pandemic showed no sign of easing overseas, a responsible government would have used this time to build up ICU capacity and vaccinate its vulnerable elderly population. However, governments at all levels were so busy implementing the zero COVID policy that they failed to do this critical work. As a result, China is opening back up unprepared for the surge in infections and hospitalizations its own studies warned would result. Now CCP is eyeing economic growth in all sectors from electronic car makers to e-commerce platforms. Beijing hopes that a booming recovery will wash away Chinese people's memory and continue to support the regime. Achieving those goals would be difficult in the best of times. Few of China's development needs can be met by the faltering finances of local governments. The urban-rural gap remains enormous in poverty, nutrition, education, and economic opportunity. Healthcare coverage is weak and forces massive saving, typically more than one-third of disposable household income. Water shortages and environmental damage can be rectified by overburdened local governments. As it usually does, Beijing is trying to reinvigorate growth through infrastructure development, permitting local governments to lend more to real estate developers and increasing exports. However, due to China's aging population and overbuilt housing and transportation networks, capital investment won't be able to drive the economy. Beijing must turn to exports. This explains China's aim to rebuild U.S. ties in diplomatic push this year. China said it will strive to recalibrate its relationship with the U.S. and increase communication with Europe as its major diplomatic tasks for 2023. We will follow through on the common understandings reached between the Chinese and U.S. presidents and work to bring bilateral relations back on the right course, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi said before Christmas. Earlier, Wang told the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in a phone call that the U.S. should stop suppressing China's development and both nations should focus on implementing a consensus reached between the leaders in Bali. The Biden administration has signaled its willingness to work with China to manage the current crisis, from facilitating solar product imports to applauding Beijing's promise at the COP27 climate conference. The White House is slow walking sanctions on TikTok and establishing only limited controls on U.S. investment in China. A better approach would be to remain on the offensive against Ms. Xi's mercantilism and find ways to undermine the Communist Party's narrative of competence and inevitable global dominance. Beijing's failures give the U.S. and its partners an opening to persuade potential allies, especially in Southeast Asia. U.S. must dismiss what the Mr. Xi calls gravitational attraction of the Chinese model. The U.S. has been the leading investor in Southeast Asia in recent years and could further boost ties by reopening negotiations to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Instead of lauding China for doggy commitments on climate change, the Biden administration should call out China's human rights abuses, exploitation of local resources, and the corrupting influence of the Belt and Road Initiative. The U.S. could also talk about environmental harm from China's economic model. China's CO2 emissions are well above those of all members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. 
it mines more coal than the US, the European Union, and India combined. And it plans to build or is already constructing more new coal-fired electric plants than the rest of the world combined. But first, win the narrative war. Continue to expose Mr. Xi's narrative of economic and political competence as a myth. This will allow the U.S. to work with allies to remind unaligned nations of the, um, of the value of the democracy and the freedom model. It also will help convince allies in the EU and elsewhere not to relent on combating CCP's mercantilism. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and a subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.